Hello, my name is Eri Redboard, Head of Legal and Government Affairs at TRM Labs, the leading provider of blockchain intelligence and anti-money laundering software. Welcome to TRM Talks. It is literally uh, two years ago, uh, this week or, or next week, uh, that we kicked off our very first uh, TRM Talks. And uh, quite frankly, being nostalgic for a moment, I can't believe sort of, you know, what, what's, what's happened in the meantime, uh, you know, all the wonderful, wonderful folks we've had on. But our very first TRM Talks was about the DOJ cryptocurrency enforcement framework uh, from really exactly two years ago. And uh, we had Jesse Liu, who's the former U.S. attorney for, for D.C., uh, Greg Monahan, who uh, who led the crypto squad with IRSCI that did many of the investigations. And we had uh, the amazing Sujit Raman, who is with us again today, who's now the general counsel of TRM, to really dig in to the DOJ's efforts um, around cryptocurrency. Uh, fast forward a year. And DOJ announces the creation of the National Cryptocurrency Enforcement Team to really lead the department's efforts um, in this space. So to sort of, uh, and then, and then, then a year later, um, you know, really just a few weeks ago, uh, DOJ uh, responded to President Biden's executive order with really a a report that builds off of the uh, the cryptocurrency enforcement framework. So. Without, with all of that said, and with, without further ado, I could not be more excited uh, to welcome uh, DOJ Digital Currency Councils and member of the NSET, Sanjeev Baskar and Paul Hemiseth, to uh, really talk through what is happening today at DOJ. And I am incredibly honored to welcome back uh, Sujit, uh, who can really sort of dig into um, you know the history here and how these new reports have built on the cryptocurrency enforcement framework, which he led the task force uh, at DOJ in in writing at the time. Before we really dig in, um, I'd love to kind of hear a little bit about your journey, um, really what what you do today, but then also your journey to the crypto space and um, and 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 how that has gone. Um, Paul, would it be okay if I kick things off with you? Absolutely. I, I mean, we were joking earlier about going way back. I would say this started with my Apple IIe and twelve hundred baud modem and. 1989 and BBSs and a pre-internet uh, world, um, but let's fast forward all the way through past law school and when I was an assistant United States attorney and was in the unique position of being both at CHIP, which is a computer hacking intellectual property specialist at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and being in the drug unit, which is rare, uh, unusual probably for obvious reasons, but it was a great place to be for dark markets and and tour and uh, cryptocurrency as it was used how it is used in that world and so uh, that really set me up for end of 2016 when agents that we worked with uh, cracked the alpha bay case and i was able to participate in that and since then it has been dark markets cryptocurrency uh, abusers, and then ultimately this latest job uh, going uh, remotely to D.C. to participate in the Digital Currency Initiative. Paul, thank you so much for that. What's so cool about that intro, and I know it's like now it's like nostalgia hour on TRM Talks, but really like at, when I left the government after about 15 years and joined TRM Labs, I really started, all right, what else, what can I get smart on? Like, what can I really learn out there? And one of the first things I did, quite frankly, was you and Grant did, uh, Grant Rabin, uh, did a webinar on darknet markets and the alpha bay takedown and uh that was sort of really one of the very first webinars of any kind sort of in this in the space that i that i watched so so thank you for that and uh yeah it's just it's just amazing work um sanjeev uh sure. tell us about your crypto journey absolutely let me just give our standard disclaimer again that we are speaking in our personal capacity not on behalf of the department but it is a pleasure to be here and we always love sharing the great stuff that we're doing as a department and really as a whole of government when it comes to digital assets uh, but in brief, you know, my, my role was sort of unique. I started as a state prosecutor in Cleveland, Ohio, had a great opportunity to really learn trying cases in state court, doing some appellate work with a great group of colleagues and supervisors that then encouraged me to try to pursue it at the federal level. I went to the Southern District of Texas and really just fell in love with the federal practice, trying a lot of cases in the border, uh, litigating a little bit in the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans and, and really getting exposed to ongoing investigations, sophisticated in nature. And then I pivoted to Charlotte, uh, the Western District of North Carolina. I sort of worked my way around the country, 
on my way eventually back to DC. Uh, really, again, multiple hats, as Paul said, opioid coordinator working on SAR reporting, uh, a lot of ongoing OSIF investigations. But I've become, began to come across cryptocurrency in our investigations, given how pervasive it can be, regardless of a blue collar or white collar type of crime. And we work a lot of dark web cases, uh, a lot of credit to law enforcement. They're really, and I say it's the humility because we're still learning, uh, really educated me and how Tor worked and the dark web worked, and we had some successes. And eventually, uh, our good friend and predecessor, as we will mention, I'm sure again, uh, Michelle Corbett, who initiated really, or was one of the initiating, initiating members of the original Digital Currency Council uh, at the Digital Currency Initiative, recruited me to come to Washington to help help her as a detailee, and then she left for greater things, and I sort of stayed in her stead, and Paul's come to join us, and we're excited. And now we've been at the Digital Currency Initiative now for the last year and a half, working it out officially in Washington, D.C. No, that that's awesome, and and nothing personal, Sujit or, or Paul, but um, you know, I, I've always been partial to the local prosecutor uh, route, uh, having been in AUSA in DC, and I, I feel like that is um, that really gives you just an incredible foundation um, for all this stuff, and and probably also an incredible foundation for adjusting to some tech difficulties that we had. This <laughs> You're always doing everything on the fly, right, <laughs> um, uh, Sujit? Just. You know, I, uh, my feelings for Sujit are are are, uh, are well known. Look, so honored to have you here, and so honored to really have had you as a first guest on on TRM because I think you just have such an amazing perspective, having been in AUSA and having been a senior um, a senior official at DOJ, and really sort of having dug into these issues. So honored to have you at TRM, and and really honored to have you on TRM talks today. Well, thanks, Harry. Honored to be here. Honored to be working with you at TRM, and honored to be on this uh, episode with Paul and Sanjeev. And, you know, my crypto journey really begins with guys like Paul and Sanjeev. Um, as you mentioned, I was an assistant U.S. attorney in the District of Maryland for many, many years. So I was a line attorney. I was a supervisor in that office. And actually, my office uh, played a critical road, uh, role in the Silk Road investigation. So the first time I had ever heard of crypto was part of the Silk Road. And I wasn't on the case. It was one of my, my close friends who was working it. And he kept telling me about, you know, dark markets and crypto and this crazy digital money that's out there. And people are just openly negotiating and buying drugs like this is crazy. And, you know, that's when I first sort of heard about crypto. When I moved to headquarters, this is around 2017, I was in the deputy attorney general's office. And my portfolio was to help oversee all of the cyber investigations that the government was was undertaking. And I kept hearing from friends in the field, you know, folks like Paul and Sanjeev saying, look, you guys need to be thinking about this at headquarters. We're doing incredible work in the field, but we need that support from headquarters and we need that broader coordination. And so whatever small role I played was really helping folks in the field, both at the U.S. attorney's offices, as well as importantly in the FBI and in other investigative agencies, make sure that they had the resources and the broader strategic framework to confront what was increasingly becoming a multi-jurisdictional international type of set of investigations. So that's how I really got to crypto. It was really by talking to people in the field, having been in the field myself. And once I was in a, a position to, you know, provide a little bit of broader strategic uh, thinking and strategic resources, frankly, tried to, tried to implement that. And so uh, in 2018, um, the attorney general had appointed me to be the chair of what was called the Cyber Digital Task Force within the department. We did a basically a 360 of all of the challenges, um, as well as opportunities that federal law enforcement was facing, particularly in light of recent sort of technological developments. And one of the sort of nuggets that came out of that report in 2018 was, hey, we're seeing a lot of use of virtual currencies for some really interesting, you know, potentially illicit uses. And so the AG pulled me aside after that report came out and said, look, I'm really intrigued by this whole virtual currency thing. I'd like to learn more. And that's really what set up the interagency or the interdepartmental uh, working group that was really starting to focus on crypto, uh, had a lot of input from the field, from the U.S. attorney community, as well as from folks all around uh, federal law enforcement. And it was ultimately that work that resulted in the cryptocurrency enforcement framework that was released in October of 2020. And I'm, I'm just so excited to see continuity, you know, between the strategic vision that was uh, put out in 2020 and all the important work that NCET and folks like Paul and Sanjeev and their colleagues are doing today. Suja, that's that's super helpful. And you know, as we get going, definitely direct folk. I'm directing folks to that. There's a handouts tab, uh, which is hopefully uh, helpful and sort of talks about uh, some resources. Uh, another resource that I don't think is in there is that first TRM talks, um, which is which is on our website. And I only say that because I'm going to ask Suja a question that I think he he probably answered 
in, in that first episode, but just sort of building on what you just said for a moment, Sujit, um, and I think you kind of got into a lot of this, but would you just level set for us a little bit? You sort of talked about that first foray into um, really providing a, a broader framework for crypto, but if you could just sort of provide a little inside baseball on sort of maybe what what was the th- what were you were thinking then, and maybe really a little bit even of how it's been built since then. Sure. I mean, again, a lot of it was informed from my own experience in the field. And again, not about me. It's really about guys like Paul and, and Sanjeev who were out there every single day, you know, doing the work, right? We had some incredible investigations, whether it was Alpha Bay, whether it was Silk Road, there were other dark markets cases where uh, the department was really forward leaning in not only thinking about criminal prosecution, but also pulling down digital infrastructure, because that is a important part of the Department of Justice's mission that people often overlook, right? They're often thinking about cops and robbers, about putting people in jail, but just as important, frankly, in this context, in the cybercrime context, is pulling down the infrastructure that hackers and other illicit actors are using. And crypto was part of that infrastructure, right? Crypto is the means by which you know, a lot of these illicit actors, at least they perceived that they had a certain level of anonymity. And actually, that was an opportunity for federal law enforcement, because even though there's a pseudo pseudonymous aspect to a lot of crypto, there's also that traceability. And that's where I really give credit to the FBI, to the IRS. You know, the investigative agencies were very forward leaning on using analytic tools like TRM and, and other tools to really get a sense of how these money flows are working. And the prosecutors were right there with them. So, you know, Ari, from my perspective, it was, let's make sure that this emerging area that has tremendous upsides, right? I mean, the whole kind of digital uh, distributed ledger technology has tremendous opportunities for the, for the world, frankly. Let's make sure that if there is illicit activity happening in this space, we're knowing about it, we're addressing it, and we're confronting it so that all the other transformational, you know, uh, opportunities that are out there are, 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 are taken advantage of. But we can't let the bad actors take it over and stifle innovation in this area. That's what motivated me. And I know for all the, the great people that I was working with, that's very much part of their vision as well, including folks like Michelle, that Sanjeev mentioned, who was you know a critical part of that whole strategic effort. Sure, yeah, no, I hope Michelle is listening to all the love uh, out, out there for sure. Um, Sanjeev, uh, moving to you for a moment, sort of building on that, you know, look, while Sujit was a partner at Sidley and now the GC of DRM, you guys have been doing a lot of, a lot of work sort of building on that framework. Can you, can you talk a little bit about um, the DOJ Digital Currency Initiative, the DCI, a little bit what that is and sort of the the overall sort of, you know, goals of the department around that. Yeah. And let me start by saying to you, crypto, you know, as pervasive as it is and it's expanding, it's somewhat of a still small world. We all know each other. We know Sujit, we know Michelle, we know Harry, we know Paul. We, we work together in the sphere. And it's always good to see our colleagues. And I agree with Sujit. You know, historically, the DOJ at that time started to see a need to start working crypto investigations. So in, around 2018, uh, the Department of Justice created this digital currency initiative, which still exists to this day. It's housed in our money laundering and asset recovery section, which we all know as MLARS. And uh, Michelle was our first U.S. digital currency counsel. And the role that the DCI played at on inception was to really support crypto investigations. And what I mean by that is supporting investigators, prosecutors, government agencies, both domestic and international, when it came to investigating digital assets, cryptocurrency. And that included prosecutions, investigations writ large, as well as forfeitures and seizures. And that was sort of the genesis of where we, you know, we began growing this area as a department. Ultimately, it's evolved, right? We have now we have two U.S. digital currency councils and our spectrum is involved, too. And Paul's going to speak here, I'm sure, shortly about that and set our great team of colleagues that we have throughout the country. But within the DCI itself, while Paul and I are the, the councils, we have a team behind us, a great team of colleagues at MLARS, other people we, we work with regularly to tackle crypto related issues. Our focus now is sort of fourfold. One is we, we handle cases. We're still federal prosecutors. So we're still prosecuting cases throughout the United States when it involves cryptocurrency related matters and handling duty calls for that matter. And for our audience, if there's calls that are coming in from the field from a variety of people, usually enforcement regarding cryptocurrency related matters. Uh, we do a lot of training as well. That would be the fundamental crypto 101. What is a wallet? What are keys? Uh, things that at some point we did not know, right? Again, coming back to the humility aspect, we needed to learn too. And we understand that we need to show that with others. And that's emerged into more um, complex issues, mixers, blenders, the like, training on those issues. Uh, we do some policy work as well, reviewing legislative testimony, potential bills with Congress, making sure that you know we are having good legislation going forward in our country. And finally, we're pivoting more into this public-private sector engagement area, being able to uh, talk with really the private sector to understand challenges we see in regulation, uh, policy, the like, 
being able to have that dialogue and making sure we have good technology here in the United States, protecting the community and also advancing this whole digital asset area. So, you know, that's a long answer for the digital currency initiative, but that's sort of how we've progressed from 2018 uh, to where we are today at the end of 2022. No, that's that, that, super helpful. And, and Paul, uh, I think Sanjeev sort of uh, mentioned the the end set, and I did in the in the in the um, intro as well. Can you talk a little bit about? That? I mean, literally, we're exactly a year in um, to the creation of the National uh, Cryptocurrency Enforcement Team. Can you talk a little bit about sort of what that is and and um, yeah, how it fits into that kind of overall crypto strategy? Sure. So so it has been about a year since it was the concept was first announced. Of course, you've got to develop the personnel. And uh, the director of the NSET, Anyan Choi, began, I think it was more like about eight months ago, and then the team started to fill in. And so while the DCI was a creation of MLARS, the Money Laundering and Asset Recovery Section, NSET was developed as a more cross-component, broader response to all of these problems that we were seeing ransomware, darknet markets, money laundering, all that sort of thing required a, a, a broader response. And um, and so we got one. And I think that's one of the unique things about NSET is that I don't see too many other examples within the department where so many components from, from MLARs, from CSIPs, which is the computer crime section, uh, we're bringing in, we brought in folks from the FBI, uh, SEC, uh, the U.S. Attorney's offices have uh, given us some detailees, and uh, I don't know what the exact number is. I think we're about 17, 18, 19 folks all right. across the country with, um, with a lot of different expertise. And I think that's what one of the distinguishing characteristics is that you've got some technical people. You've got some deep legal thinkers, for instance, from the appellate section. Uh, you've got some truly tested trial practitioners um, and some folks from CSIPS, for instance, who have been there from the beginning, uh, Alden Pelker, Jessica Peck, uh, Louisa Marion, and so forth. And it's it's really an amazing team. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're there to enforce the law, which never went away with regard to all of these crimes that are now being facilitated in a, in a brand new way uh, with, with cryptocurrency. And certainly there's a lot of innovative, a very interesting, perhaps world changing uses for cryptocurrency. But at the same time, uh, some crooks have figured out how to leverage the anonymity, how to leverage the irreversible and global nature of crypto. And, and, and that's why we're there to enforce the law with regard uh, to those aspects of it. So if there's one distinguishing characteristic, I'd say it's broad and uh, and we're here to learn and to advance the, the mission. Yeah. Paul, I really appreciate that. And so st sticking with you for a moment, um, because there really have been some extraordinary cases brought by NSAID and then obviously AUSA is in the field over the last few years um, or last year or so. Uh, again, very ha having been a prosecutor for a long time, knowing you cannot speak about sort of specific cases or pending cases. But um, are are there sort of maybe you know are there any cases you can sort of talk about in terms of the work that that's been done to date? Well, I mean, to date, what I think about is that cryptocurrency, even if we take it at it, its most you know um, incipient moment, right, uh, two thousand nine for the Satoshi white paper, we've had some some great successes. Uh, at the end of the day, I think we've reacted very well in terms of cases. If we were to divide them up, I think I'd talk about the dark market cases going back to Silk Road, Alpha Bay, and then all of the international cases that I think this is one of the successes as well. We work very well with others, uh, with the Europeans, uh, you know, with the Thais, um, and, and, and we're continuing in that in that vein that even if it's not our case, we're there to help. And that pays off because those data sets have been helpful to the other cases uh, that have come forward, like the Helix case, like the Hydra case, uh, the Bitfinex hack was linked to old data that was captured from our old cases. And so, you know, the Bitfinex hack ongoing case can't talk about it very much, but 
allegedly resulting in the seizure of billions of dollars. And it is proof to me of this concept that blockchains are forever and even old transactions can come back to haunt somebody. And so the, the lesson there, I think, is that no matter how clever one thinks one is, uh, you may never be able to stop looking behind your shoulder uh, to take into account that technology advances, that tracing gets better, that law enforcement figures out. And it's this continuing you know, struggle, but um, it, it's proof to me that we, we have some excellent, very smart, very dedicated folks on our side that will that will continue the mission. The fraud section has also had some great cases that they announced just a couple of months ago, six very interesting fraud-oriented cases that heavily featured cryptocurrency. Um, and it's through those cases that you can see that this instant irreversible nature of crypto is, is both a feature and... Um, but it's also an opportunity for, for criminals. So um, there have been some good cases. At the same time, there's been a lot of ongoing losses. Pig butchering cases are on the rise. Uh, we're finding that traditional schemes are gaining a new life with cryptocurrency, and, and that's in part why the, the NSET was created. That's uh that's really helpful. There, there's a uh, there's a question that sort of goes to this in the chat, and I'm going to give it a shot. Sujit, feel free to jump in. Um, around sort of like you know, should we expect the pace to even pick up of these types of you know prosecutions, investigations? And and what what I've told people, it's interesting. Like you know, the summer was crazy. We saw a like uh, Paul, you mentioned the uh, the fraud section cases. We saw a whole number of fraud investigations. Um, we saw a whole a number of other insider trading related. Um. And it felt like the speed was picking up in terms of enforcement actions and um, and and criminal prosecutions. And what I try to explain to folks is that, like, you, look, what you're talking about here is a, a a strategy that's played over the course of time, right? Like, you know, the NSET was stood up a year ago. Prior to that, you have the enforcement framework. And really, what we're seeing now are the cases that are the fruits of a lot of that initial work. You know, gaining the expertise. So I, I think that my my answer to this um, would be, I think we're likely to see. Uh, the continued expansion of these types of prosecutions. Um, but it's not surprising. It's not because there's more crypto crime necessarily. It's because we're getting better, we're getting smarter, or you know, I should say DOJ is getting better and smarter <laughs> and having the expertise to prosecute these cases. And just sort of going back to, to Paul's point, um, which I think is an excellent one, I use the Bifinex example all the time as sort of like the blockchain is forever. Um, the tools are getting better, right? You know, you, you, know, you didn't have a TRM you know, six years ago, whatever it is. Um, and it's almost like DNA evidence where you have the, the information, uh, you might not have the technology, um, but you can go back and investigate these cases because, because of the, the unique qualities of, of the blockchain. I, I think that's accurate. And let me add this here if I could, yep. you know, you know, our, our deputy assistant, our deputy attorney general, excuse me, Lisa Monica had a great comment after the whole colonial pipeline incident about the most basic powerful tool we have is following the money it's it's sort of nascent to all type of crime we follow the money we trace the money we can locate the bad guys and, and that was the case in 2021 where we saw a tangible effect in our economy our community the colonial pipeline was affected by viruses shut down temporarily around memorial day early may of 2021 on the whole east coast those on the east coast remember that gas prices went up there was a gas shortage but we were able to trace a ransom payment made by the victim to a uh, illegal group and based in russia recover, I believe, almost $2.3 million at that time in value of cryptocurrency and return that to the victim because we were using blockchain analytics or being able to trace and follow the money to be able to really make the victim whole and try to stop these crimes. So I would agree with you wholeheartedly. As we move forward, we have, these records are immutable. Tracing tools will help us. And that's a great example, again, of the DOJ working as a whole. And we work with our, both our U.S. attorneys' offices and our main justice components, as well as our international counterparts, to go ahead and recover a really good portion of that ransom payment to make the victim whole again. No, that, that that's super helpful, Paul. Paul, and I'm anxious, Sujit, for you to jump in on this one as well. Um, one one of the roles, and I think Sanjeev got to this earlier, has really been for uh, the NSET uh, to respond to questions in the executive order or taskings in the executive order 
uh, from the Biden administration on cryptocurrency. And I know most of the folks on this call would be tracking, but basically in March, the Biden administration put out an executive order that essentially tasks the interagency, executive branch agencies, with producing a, a comprehensive framework through a series of reports. So an illicit finance report from Treasury, um, you know, uh, and a, uh, you know, reports on, on central bank digital currencies, that, that sort of things so on stable coins. Um, Paul, you know, DOJ produced two reports, one on sort of international cooperation, and we'll get to that one in a moment, but focusing on the, the more recent report um, from a few weeks ago on sort of investigating and prosecuting crypto related cases. Can you talk a little bit about that report, sort of how it came to be, what, what the NSAID and DOJ were thinking around it and, 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 and any sort of highlights? Well, I'm, I, my hats are off to my colleagues on the NSET that were responsible for uh, the, the report. It's, it's comprehensive. I think it's thoughtful. I think it takes into account uh, the challenge, which is the new technology and the application of you know, our current laws and our current framework. Work. I would say that it begins, if, if I were to summarize the whole thing, with um, observing that cryptocurrency is used to commit crime, like to buy drugs or to fund terrorist activities. And then it goes on and it's, it observes that crypto can be used to launder money from those activities. And then, and then it observes that the entire crypto ecosystem uh, can be vulnerable in itself, the target of crime in the form of hacks and fraud and exploits. Uh, and that sort of thing. And then it goes on to describe the challenges posed by these new uh, systems and the, the pseudo anonymous and sometimes the outright anonymous nature of some of the protocols and the platforms and, and how that uh, is a challenge to investigators. And then it goes on to make actual concrete suggestions about what can be done um, in, in terms of moving forward to overcome those, because as I mentioned earlier, it's a bit of an arms race. Someone comes up with a little something, uh, law enforcement um, studies it and figures out a response, and then there's a counter response and so forth. And so the, the suggestions revolve around um, enhancing law enforcement's abilities to uh, gather evidence and to uh, initiate prosecutions, to to strengthen certain laws and penalty provisions that play an important role in these digital asset prosecutions, uh, to support regulations um, that, that better support the, the goal of the Bank Secrecy Act, for instance, with re regard to KYC, because there are there may be some gaps at this point uh, with regard to the traditional institutions that we have versus uh, you know, these, these new exchanges, which simply didn't exist uh, a decade ago. And then, you know, finally, to ensure that law enforcement and agencies have the resources that they need. And, and one of the concrete responses beyond in, in reaction to all of this is the creation of the, the DAC network, the Digital Asset Coordinator Network, which is a broader set of federal prosecutors. The goal is to have one much like a chip in every U.S. attorney's office that is uh, approaching a subject matter expertise on that on on cryptocurrency and digital assets, such that they can pass that along, such that there's no bottleneck when there's a case that comes up in the ordinary course uh, that involves digital assets. So, great report. To some extent, it speaks for itself. It's right there on the uh, online. Uh, I would encourage everyone to take a look. Terrific. Yeah, no, Paul, Paul thank you so much. Um, Sujit, I know you've obviously reviewed this report. I think we've reviewed it together. Uh, could you talk a little bit about sort of how it builds on the cryptocurrency enforcement framework um, and then just sort of any key takeaways that you had in terms of reading it? Yeah, I mean, you know, as I mentioned at the asset area, I, I think the overall message is one of continuity. I, I think it seems like, and I'm, I'm saying this as an outside observer, I think the department clearly is trying to communicate that, you know, the way it's thinking about crypto enforcement generally is a story of sort of measured expansion, right? I don't see any huge changes in pivot, any pivoting here. Uh, what I do see are resources. You know, we're seeing uh, Paul and Sanjeev have both mentioned the the sort of structures that have been sent up, uh, set up within the department to encourage, you know, uh, sort of uh, sharing of information, both internally as well as internationally. We're seeing, you know, the the network of prosecutors all around the country, which is really a big step, you know, bureaucratically to set that up. I'm sure is a is a challenge, but that shows the commitment of the department to 
provide resources. Um, you know, I'm sure uh, industry will have its own views about uh, about that, but it's it's an important step for the department to be sort of putting its money where its mouth is and, and building that that network. I guess, Paul, one question or Sanjeev I'd have for you guys, you know, having read the report, one thing that did strike me that's a little bit different than a couple of years ago is the attention paid to DeFi and decentralized finance. And obviously that's at the cutting edge of a lot of the work that I suspect you guys are doing. And this really does feed into one of the questions we have in the chat. I'm just curious, you know, one of the, the sort of themes of DeFi is removing intermediaries, right? Sort of cutting out the middleman and letting people interact directly with whoever they want to interact with. But of course, when it comes to law enforcement, intermediaries play a huge role, whether it's helping, you know, uh, run AML programs, whether it's actually receiving subpoenas and responding <laughs> to the information requests that you have. And again, without getting into any particular cases or anything like that, obviously you've been thinking about DeFi, it's in the report. And I'm curious, how do you deal with a world in which intermediaries might disappear? How do you serve your subpoenas? Who do you, who do you arrest? <laughs> you know, what do you do? Um, again, not to put you on the spot, and I'm sure there's a lot of thinking going on internally, but that's one area, that's one thing that I noticed that, that has evolved in the last couple of years. And I, I'd be very curious to the extent our, our colleagues or our, our friends on the, on the chat can talk about it, um, what the current thinking is there. I think, I think that that is an excellent question because at the heart of the DeFi movement, at least from some parts of the community, is that uh, you know, they're questioning, maybe they're hoping for a world where the courts and uh, law enforcement and intermediaries are, are no longer part of, of their financial process. Uh, you know, code is law, as they say. So why, why even involve uh, all those other folks when you, with your private key, uh, can can conduct all of these transactions? And and I, you know, I've attended a lot of these these functions. I don't agree philosophically uh, with a lot of of the sentiment, but you know, that is tempered to some extent. Uh, through the immutability and you know the the transparentness of some parts of the blockchain, in, in some ways, uh, you know the, the the lack of subpoena power and that sort of thing is mitigated by the fact that in in some situations you can just look at the blockchain, and and that is the argument by some is that well you know doesn't this provide the uh, the transparency uh, that is required to have a well-functioning society that, that is not simply anarchy with regard to money flows and, and drug flows and, and, and the, that whole uh, world. Um, but you can imagine a world also where that transparency is diminished in a, in a technological fashion, right? Uh, AECs, anonym, anonymity enhanced coins, uh, blockchains that aren't completely transparent, uh, privacy tools and so forth. Um, it, it is a challenge. Um, you know, we wonder also about the world of DeFi exploits. You know, some people call them hacks. Some people would say, oh, well, you know, isn't that just the way the code is written? Um, and so, yes, huge challenge. Uh, I, I don't think DeFi means the Wild West. I think that there is a role for law enforcement. Um, and um, it, it is going to be the challenge of applying the current law and perhaps uh, advocating for some new laws that, that bring us into that world uh, of, you know, not entering some, some, some world of, of, of online anarchy with regard to, to money and services in DeFi. Yeah, I, I, I think that's exa exactly right. And, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think the nature of the blockchain to some extent, Sujit, we talk about this all the time, really allows for um, the community to police itself. And I think that's where the question was going in the chat. Um, you know, we at TRM, we, we've partnered with some of the leading crypto businesses on something called Chain Abuse, which is a crowdsourced platform where people put in hacks and scams. And there's a uh, the ability to um, the ability to uh, to um, send a message to law enforcement in there to alert law enforcement of, of that. So I think the the nature of blockchains that immutable ledger allows for um, all kinds of different um, ways for the community to police itself um, using tools, using that transparency. Um, so I think it's an interesting, uh, you know, definitely kind of an interesting space. And I think we're, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing this develop before our eyes, right? Um, you know, with Tornado Cash and other types of, uh, of scenarios. 
um, for sure. Suja, anything to add to all of that? Um, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> well, you know, the, the only thing I, I would add, Ari, is you know, you mentioned uh, privacy and financial technologies, and, and Paul mentioned that as well in his in his um, when he was speaking. And you know, it, it's very interesting. When I served in the department, uh, I was there in 2018 when the GDPR was um, you know promulgated when it went into effect. And there were a lot of questions about how data privacy laws around the world, and now it's expanded, right? Now even China has a data privacy law. And I, I would be curious, you know, Paul, you had mentioned the fact that we there was sort of data that the department had in its possession is ultimately what led to, you know, some of the investigative uh, advances that you were able to make in particular cases, whether it's Bitfinex, whether it's Colonial Pipeline, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I, I'm just curious, you know, is the department thinking through how data privacy laws, particularly international data privacy laws, intersect with your ability to run your investigations? In other words, do you have people telling you, sorry, I don't maintain that information anymore because GDPR, I got rid of it. Yeah. Um, and if so, like, you know, you, you talk about international cooperation, international partnerships, <coughs> data privacy law get in your way? Or is it something that's actually ultimately, because it's crypto and it's a blockchain and privacy is a little bit different, are you, are you not really seeing much? I yeah. can speak in generalities, which is to say that this uh, intersection of anonymity and privacy is a difficult thing. Um, it, it it is no, there's no obvious solution to it. That there's obviously a role for for privacy and and in speaking with uh, the private. Uh, with private industry about this, you know, I think it's well understood that uh, no one wants their private uh, pharmacy purchases, uh, you know, on a blockchain or available to the rest of the world uh, on a blockchain or not on a blockchain, right? I mean, you know, with our with our current system, there are some vulnerabilities there, and so we're working through it. And I think that there's a healthy respect on the part of government for privacy. Uh, but at the same time, there's there's a balance with accountability, and um, I have faith that that our our lawmakers and our enforcers and our regulators are taking all of that into account. Paul, Paul, super super helpful. And building on that a little bit, um, Sanjeev, as we mentioned earlier, sort of the first report in response to the executive order was around international cooperation. It obviously didn't take a report. For DOJ to start working with partners globally. Obviously, that was something Sujit worked on, you know, while he was at the department. Um, but can, can, can you talk about th that report a little bit and sort of how, how DOJ is thinking about international cooperation? If you look at sort of the really the, the biggest, most important crypto investigations from Welcome to Video to Hydra to Silk Road, um, these all involved intense, from my experience, international cooperation with global law enforcement partners. Um, can you t sort of talk through that a little bit? Yeah. Can you hear me at all, Ari? Let me ask you. Yeah, you you're great now. Yep. My screen is frozen, so I'm glad you can hear me. But uh, I, uh, yeah. as good look at, as good looking as you are, the audio is more important than the video. So let's. What do you got? Yep. Uh, I'll say this uh, again with credit to our colleagues in the end. Said many eyes looked at this, and again, compliments to our director on Young for helping helping us get this product across the finish line. The the international report starts with really the basic premise that when it comes to digital assets, there are certain features that make these transactions. Uh, more transnational in nature, right? And when we start with that, and we realize that the report walks through sort of the status of international cooperation and how we can strengthen cooperation going forth. And it leaves us with really three points. I'll, and I'll mention those here. I think they're important to mention. Uh, one is the need for formal training when it comes to sophisticated matters, understanding blockchain trading, decentralized finance, how we analyze mixers, tumblers, you mentioned Tornado Cash. The reality that we need training support resources both domestically and internationally to the reality we need real-time information sharing and deconfliction of investigations and that includes being able to identify what is your central governing authority for us in the united states that is our office of international affairs which we colloquially refer to as oia uh, being able to service these mutual serve these mutual legal assistance treaties internationally to get information in a, in a real-time process not waiting not delaying that because again these investigations are happening in real time with exigent assets, assets internationally. And then finally, the third aspect, we have the, again, the training capacity, importance, the reality of real-time sharing and information deconfliction, but also the importance of having a uniform anti-money laundering, combating the financing of terrorism, we refer to that as AML, CFT regulations throughout. And what I mean by that is 
reading the Fed as a financial action task force or looking at the MECA, the markets and crypto assets, and being able to say, how can we have consistent regulation for crypto assets domestic and abroad so criminals, one, don't have the opportunity to have safe harbor in a foreign country, something we often call judicial arbitrage, and two, making sure that uh, the countries are consistent in their understanding of the technology and their regulation of it. So those are three recommendations that came out of the report with the goal being to strengthen the cooperation of our international counterparts as we move forward in this digital asset arena. Fantastic. Um, Suja, just sort of following up quickly with you on that. I mean, obviously, a big piece of the the first enforcement framework was around this. I mean, look, cross-border you know, value transfer at the speed of the internet is going to require this level of cooperation. And I think Sanjeev got to a lot of the keys there. But any sort of additional thoughts from your time at DOJ or beyond on, on the importance of international cooperation? No, I mean, it's just, you know, I think, Ari, uh, you've already touched on it. What what's really strikes me over the last couple of years is how the international interest in this issue has also grown considerably. So, you know, you have digital asset regulation in parts of the world where there simply was none a couple of years ago. So you've got countries like, you know, Singapore that are quite forward leaning. You've got many Middle Eastern nations that are quite forward leaning. And with all of that regulation comes a heightened sensitivity to law enforcement, right? Making sure that if people are going to be engaging in these kinds of activity in a regulated way, that illicit actors are identified, that they're, you know, uh, investigated, prosecuted, et cetera. So at least what strikes me and, and Eric, you and I, you know, see this every day in, in our day-to-day role is the interest in this kind of work all around the world. The United States in many ways has been a leader when it comes to law enforcement issues on sort of international crypto uh, investigations, you know, all the dark market uh, cases that Paul was referring to earlier. But now we're seeing a similar kind of interest in other parts of the world. And to me, that's a market um, uh, development. And it'll be interesting to see how that develops over time, because, you know, historically, particularly when it came to cyber and other AML type investigations, the United States was really the leader. Are we now going to see, you know, prosecutions and sort of public, you know, indictments coming from other countries, whether it's the UK or European nations? That'll be really interesting to see. Singapore, you know, we don't know. Um, so I, I could see that uh, kind of international dimension expanding over time. And I think we're well, that trend is well underway. Terrific. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Um, Sanjeev, sort of moving back to you and Paul, feel free to jump in on this one as well. Um, you know, an area that's near and dear to my heart is sort of the public-private uh, partnerships in this space today. And um, the the report obviously talks about this and so does the executive order. Um, Sanjeev, and it, it actually goes to a question that's in that's in the chat as well, sort of like, you know, I think the overwhelming majority of crypto businesses of sort of the crypto industry is licit and um, really and, and wants to help in the work you're doing because the key is to keep bad actors out of this new, this this ecosystem. What What is a good public-private partnership look like um, in your mind, Sanjeev, with DOJ in particular, um, and sort of how can the crypto community engage? Absolutely. And I appreciate that question. Uh, let me start by saying, again, this is in our report. This is public. We yep. consult stakeholders with stakeholders regarding legislative proposals, uh, regulatory issues, policy matters in the digital space area. And we meet with various members, really, of the private industry on ways to work together to combat the criminal misuse of digital assets. You know, our goal is to have a positive dialogue where we encourage crypto anti-money laundering compliance, and we work together on combating illegal misuse of digital assets. Some of that is going to conferences. You'll see us at conferences speaking, including like the ABA conference some of our colleagues spoke at recently, and I've spoken at a couple myself and Paul as well, being able to, one, appreciate the technology. We want you to understand, you know, what does zero knowledge proofs? Or can we talk a little bit about mixers and tumblers that are coming about? One, so we can understand it. But two, also to encourage the private sector to self-regulate at some level. I know uh, Suja mentioned initially about DeFi. What I've learned too, and a positive, I guess positive spirit is some of the players in DeFi have centralized aspects. They have general counsels. They are interested in making sure their technology is safe and that we don't have a worst case scenario happening where the technology is used to enter the community or to hurt the community. And what we've encouraged really the private sector is to join us in the dialogue. And I know we're speaking here uh, regarding the DOJ's premise, but a lot of our components, the SEC has developed a fin hub, the CFTC has done the same to engage with the private sector and say, come to us, let's discuss the white papers, let's see the best way we can move forward in the emerging technology area, understanding that you know we encourage good technology in the United States, we want to have the dialogue, 
And we think it's better to do that together. One, again, going back to my humility premise, we're learning too, and we wanna learn from you how the technology works, but two, we can help you when it comes to the discussion regarding regulatory matters, legal matters, so we don't have a situation where terrorism is being funded or uh, dark web ransomware activities are happening. We mentioned the colonial pipeline. We can address that on the front end. So you know, our guidance is to be upfront, to engage, and the options are there for us to do so. Terrific. Yeah, no, thank you so much. As we are definitely sort of uh, running out of time here, I think I'm going to do sort of a, a, a final wrap up um, with, with with each of you. Um, look, I, I think a lot of it, it's interesting, you know, uh, the the first cryptocurrency enforcement framework, uh, and I'll blame Sujit for this, you know, I think it was, you know, there was one page about the opportunities and then, I don't know, 70 pages of, of sort of risk. But that's the nature of being prosecutors, right? You're looking for what are the risks uh, and challenges and how to ultimately mitigate those risks. Um, what, what, sh what should, what, if, if you could say anything to sort of the crypto community today as, you know, as part of the Department of Justice or in your individual capacities, ha however you want to couch it, like what, what would you say to folks today to really kind of take away, uh, take away from this, um, from this panel? Um, Paul, can I kick things off with you? Sure. I mean, w one thing that we that we think about is is ways to to consider patterns through which to consider our actions and so forth. Uh, if it's not already done, and I know I talked to some private actors, they think exactly in this way. One thing that I would suggest is to consider this old legal principle, right? I think it's Oliver Wendell Holmes considered the bad man. You know, how is the law going to react to the bad man? Uh, and, and in these days, we should say the, the bad person, right, that, that, is, that has bad intent and how are they going to take advantage of things that we might consider public goods. We might consider, uh, you know, anonymity in some circumstances to be a public good, but how are bad people with bad intent going to use and take advantage of those ideas to, uh, to traffic drugs, to fund terrorism, uh, nation states that divert uh, billions of dollars literally in hacked funds to weapons programs of their own and so forth. And so uh, to me, that that is is the message is that let, let's work together and reasonably think about how we can create this uh, this balance um, and to to match up the the concepts of identity to accountability tempered by privacy and so forth. F fantastic. Um, Sanjeev, what, what, uh, final thoughts? You know, I think Paul hit the nail on the head. You know, dialogue is good. I'll leave you with an antidote. I spoke at a conference recently, and afterwards, uh, once the conference finished, we were approached by people who said, you know what, Sanjeev, uh, the government on TV or in the movies, if you will, tongue and cheek, seem like, uh, like difficult, difficult to deal with, but you guys seem like regular people, down-to-earth people that really want to have good technology that's safe for the community, that protects the community, and that's good to hear. And I think I leave the audience with this mindset that as a whole of government, DOJ, SEC, CFTC, every component you can think of, both domestically and internationally, we are trying to work together to have good policy, good regulation, protecting the community, and we're calling upon the private sector to partner with us in these working groups, in these dialogues, in these uh, conversations, because crypto is here to stay, right? And these blockchain tracing analytic companies and all the resources, including Terum Labs, they exist to, you know, affect the crypto sphere, advance investigations, protect AML compliance. And we think that's a good thing. We want you to engage with us on that on the front end and hopefully doing that going forward, we can have good, good technology here in the United States. Fantastic. Regular people with exceptional haircuts is, is how I'm going uh, <laughs> to how I'm gonna couch, how I'm gonna couch what you're doing out there, Sanjeev. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Sujit, sort of key, key takeaways either from today or sort of from your time at, at, at DOJ, really what you're seeing in the space now. Yeah, no, no. I mean, look, the, I'm so glad that we ended the conversation on the public-private discussion because I think that that is critically important. You know, the ecosystem does need to police itself to some extent and make sure that if there are bad actors that we are working aggressively to, to root out that uh, work. But where, you know, there is the need for public law or public authorities to get involved, that they have space to do their work. You know, the only thing I would say in, in, in sort of in conclusion for myself, having been out of government for a couple of years now and being in the industry, uh, and our colleagues, you know, on the call are both career prosecutors. They know this, um, you know, industry is always concerned about uh, sort of, you know, prosecution or regulation by prosecution or regulation by enforcement. Um, this is not a theme that is new to them. Um, 
you know, there is concern, right? And it's not really DOJ so much. I think it's some of the other agencies that have um, uh, authorities in the regulatory space and the enforcement space. And, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I would just sort of make sure that everyone is aware of that, that concern on industry's part. Um, again, none of this is new to our, our very experienced uh, colleagues who are career prosecutors, but it's one area where I think industry would love to get the guidance where it's needed, um, because I think, you know, the vast majority of players in this industry are looking to do the right thing. They're looking to comply. They're trying to do the right thing. And sometimes it's just a question of, you know, what's the right guidance? And so I'm sure um, as the department keeps thinking through its strategy efforts in this area, that'll also be one of its priorities as well. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you, Paul. Um, and of course, thank you, Sujit, for, for joining um, for joining today. And to everyone out there, thank you so much. Um, you, just a couple of quick, fun housekeeping things. Please subscribe to TRM's weekly roundup. Follow us on social media. Um, and really, most importantly, I think to celebrate the two-year anniversary, we're doing multiple uh, TRM talks in October. So uh, tune in on October 19th for crypto regulation in Latin America. And we may even have some other surprises uh, sprinkled in uh, across the next uh, month or so. So um, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you really everyone out there for working with us to build a safer financial system.